So uh, it's wonderful to see everybody here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jeff Garrett. I'm Dean of the Marshall School and welcome to Trojan Family Weekend. I know uh, none of you is here to, to listen to me. You're here to listen to our distinguished guests. So without further ado, I want to I want to introduce Michael Rubin, who's uh, become just a wonderful friend of mine in the last 18 months or so. And it's fantastic to have Michael here with us today as a proud new Marshall parent. So. So I. I there are a lot of people in the room, which makes me think you know quite a bit about Michael's business empire, Fanatics. But it's, a, it's an extraordinary business uh, which has an expanding number of verticals. And so I, I, went to the, I went to the Fanatics Inc. website, the corporate site, not the, not the merch site. You said the boring one. The, the, the kind of one where I'm likely to go, you know, in, and I go straight to about us and I'm looking at investor relations. Yes, that's exactly what happened to me. I went to the Fanatics Inc. website today and so the Fanatics, no surprise, is all about fans and the, the Fanatics database now has over 100 million global registered users. Um, the Fanatics has partnerships with 900 plus sports properties. Uh, including uh, all the major sports in the United States, um, college teams, players associations, retail partners. And I, I think you know that Michael is in the relationships and the stars business. Um, over, uh, Fanatics is associated with over 2,500 athletes and celebrities, and more than 200 of those are exclusives to Fanatics. And I didn't know the last two things, which uh, uh, blew my mind. There are over 2,000 Fanatics retail outlets these days, and you have over 22,000 people working in the company. So, Michael, welcome. Thank you. Very now, good to be here. Now, now, since uh, this is a big and complicated business that you built with your own hands, I thought I'd give you the chance to do a little infomercial on how you, how you see the company today. And if you don't uh, say the things that I hope you'll say, I'll bug you and interrupt you. So do you want to start with a little bit about where Fanatics is today? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Um, this is the closest I ever got to college in my entire life. Which is not yeah. true. Yeah. Six weeks? Did I did make say? it through six weeks of Villanova, but I was yeah. always in the parking lot buying and selling footwear clothes out and never really paying paying attention to school. So you guys are much better positioned than I am to do much better things. So uh, again, honored to be here. So look. Um, you know, my story is pretty well known. I started, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a young kid. I was really not good at anything but working. So as a young kid, um, I was terrible at sports. I was terrible at school, but the one thing I lo loved to do was always work, and so I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've okay, been. so then we're, you're, gonna, you're jumping ahead in my list of well, questions. Just try, just try All right. Up so, but I've heard, I've heard this story, and I think uh, probably some people in the audience have heard the story, but it's a great story, which is Michael started as an entrepreneur when he was a, high, a teenager in the Philly suburbs, um, selling people skis which is serious risky business on the East Coast because it can be feast or famine in terms of how much snow there is and therefore how good the business is. So what was the rise and fall of your ski empire when you were a kid? Well, I've nearly gone bankrupt you know, many times in my life. And I think that's part of growing in business. And I think that's part of how you learn, you get better. And you know, I legitimately started in business when I was eight years old, to your point, Jeffrey. I started a ski tuning shop in my parents' basement when I was 12 years old. And um, I was lucky, a friend of mine said to me like, hey, um, you know, you love business, it's the only thing you're really good at, and you love skiing, um, why don't you open a ski tuning shop? And I did, and sure enough, um, you know, two years later I actually um, had made enough money from people who had consigned lent me skis to sell them out of my basement. I actually had made about $25,000. I decided I wanted to open a real store at 14 years old, about 10 minutes from my parents' house. And um, the first year was actually amazing. Did one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in revenue. Um, Fourteen years old, couldn't drive to get there. You know, <laughs> you had no idea what I was doing, but I just kind of figured it out. And um, you know, the next year was also pretty good. And then at sixteen, we had a small little issue. It didn't actually snow that year. And if you're in the ski business, it doesn't snow. Um, and then you get a little bit cocky, you get ahead of yourself. Um, you find yourself with a little bit of problems. So at sixteen years old, I literally 
Um, thought I was going bankrupt for the first time in my life. I actually owed two hundred thousand dollars of um, two hundred thousand dollars to vendors. I had about eighty thousand dollars of inventory. It was so bad that I got sued probably a hundred times um, that year. And I used to have there, there was a sheriff. She was a very nice woman. She'd show up at my house every day before school to drop me off those days' lawsuits. And she'd come, she'd ring the bell, I'd open the door, hey, how are you, give her a hug, here are your lawsuits for the day. Um, and um, I'm like, I'm a complete disaster, it's over for me. You know, I had a mom who was like a psychiatrist, and father was a veterinarian, being a business person was very odd to them. My mom said, like, I know what's best for you, just like, you need to give up on this stupid business shit that you're doing, and kind of like, you know, go to school like a normal kid. And um, I hired a bankruptcy lawyer, and the bankruptcy lawyer, um, got all the creditors together. I thought they were actually gonna kill me. And someone looked and said, by the way, how old are you? I said, oh, I'm 16. And they all, their faces all turned white. And that's my really, you have to be 18 to incur debt legally. And actually, um, it was actually, a very, it was a very good moment. And um, I always had a little bit of leverage. I learned about leverage very quickly. And the bankruptcy lawyer took me in a different room. He said, hey, can you get any money to pay these people back? And sure enough, 18 cents on the dollar, $38,000. Um, we settled the debts. and. It's the first time I ever went to borrow money in my life from, from, from my family. My family. I grew up very middle class. Um, you know, the house that I grew up in was, you know, my parents bought it for forty two thousand dollars. It's probably a five hundred thousand dollar house today. And I went to my dad and said, "Look, you know, I need to, you know, is there any way you lend me, you know, the thirty eight thousand dollars to pay off my bills?" And my parents got together and they basically said, "If you agree to shut the business down and go to college, you got a deal." I said, "Absolutely, deal. College it is. Borrowed the thirty eight thousand dollars and then like." Ten days later, there was another ski shop that went bankrupt. They, and I actually didn't go bankrupt. They went bankrupt and all their stuff got auctioned off. And it was $200,000 of inventory. It got auctioned off for $13,000. So I bought it. Um, <laughs> and I went home. I said, Dad, I got great news. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to be able to pay you back more quickly. I just need to borrow another $13,000. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, I bought $200,000 of inventory for $13,000. And uh, I just need irresistible, right? It was too good a deal. I need to just borrow this thirteen thousand, and then I'll be able to get you this money back pretty quickly. He says, "No." I said, "Dad, it's illegal to make a commitment to the state of Pennsylvania to buy this inventory and you know not be able to pay. like I'll go to jail. I said, Enjoy jail. Like, I'm not giving you the money." Um, so I actually I learned about you know just like perseverance. I went door to door like, and I knew a lot of my neighbors. I'd always been like a hustler. Hey, I need to borrow money. First neighbor, like, no way. Second neighbor, no. Third neighbor, yeah, I'll lend you the money. $1,000 a week interest. Um, which I thought was a great deal, by the way. Like, I was like, you know, what's like, you know, 7% a week interest seemed amazing. Um, borrowed the money. I didn't know we had that kind of activity in the Philly suburbs. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I thought it was all in Jersey. But, 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 uh, I thought it was no, a great no, deal. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the kids here who go to college here won't know what this is, but there were these things called yellow pages. Okay? <laughs> like a phone book. So I got this phone book out, it was like this thick, and I started calling the ski shops and saying like, hey, you know, I've got some skis, can I sell this to you? And within three weeks I sold probably a quarter of the inventory, paid back the $16,000, um, the $13,000 plus the $3,000 in interest, and had three quarters of the inventory left. The reason I tell you all this And story, then it must have snowed. It didn't snow actually. Oh, it, didn't, it, it didn't snow that year. But the interesting thing for me was, here I was, Three months earlier, thinking I'm a complete failure, that this isn't going to work, that this business thing isn't good for me, and I should just, you know, go be a normal kid. And then, you know, I take these risks, and sure enough, you know, I get myself in the closeout business. Well, three years later, I was 21 years old. I was the largest buyer and seller of closeout footwear in, in the world, doing 150 million dollars at age 21, making 15 million dollars a year. So I tell you all of this because. You Is know, this to, a don't go to college story? It's, it's, actually, it's, actually, it's actually not. I would have died to go to a school like this, but I couldn't get in. You know, um, you, know you would not have had I, I, I always tell the students yeah. that life isn't linear. I think uh, this is uh, not that interesting. You think I could come with you actually let me in here now? I, 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 okay. We, we have a lot of graduate programs, in, including, <laughs> including some for sort of more mature age students. I'm out, I'm out for that. The more mature thing will work. You're not going to work. Okay, yeah. let's fast forward. So, um, the skis is not the only thing that you bought. So I think the, the first time I really knew about Fanatics, and I think I told you this, uh, I listened to an interview you did with Bill Simmons on um, acquiring Tops, the trading card company. When was that, 21 or? Beginning of 22. Yeah. Um, 
And you know, here was this iconic thing, but kind of really sleepy, and we're now in the digital age, right? This is baseball trading cards. So many people think this was you know, the, the, the supercharged moment. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what your thinking was, how big that business is? Yeah, probably worth it to back up for just a second to frame how we got into the trading card business. Okay. Because for us, you know, most people think of fanatics for you know all the apparel we sell, all the USC merchandise. You know, we operate the NFL shop, the NBA store. I'm going to ask you about store. that. Yeah, but it leads into the trading yeah, card okay. business. And so um, we had to build a business that by 2020 we were selling maybe four or five billion dollars a year of licensed sports merchandise. A lot of brands, you know, so we own lids. We have 1,350 uh, headwear stores. Uh, we operate 650 college bookstores. You know, if you buy licensed sports merchandise, it's often coming from fanatics. And the interesting thing was, when I sold my first company in 2011, my single biggest fear was being put out of business by Amazon. And so I spent the first, and by the way, Amazon put a lot of big retailers out of business. My whole company, mm -hmm. its number one customer was Toys R Us, bankrupt. Number two, Sports Authority, bankrupt. Eric Pastel went through bankruptcy. GNC went through bankruptcy. So I just assumed Amazon was coming to kill us, which they wanted to. And so the first nine years of building Fanatics was really about how do we you know, do something that's great for the fan? How do we do something that's, you know, we build a, build a very good defensible position. And um, it wasn't until 2020 when I woke up and said, okay, we actually did something really differentiated. Now I can think about what's next. And so I looked and said, where can we take Fanatics? I said, I want to really reinvent the company from kind of a, a merchandise company, kind of the, the place where most sports fans go to, to get their merchandise, to really a digital sports platform. Okay, but this is the does not compute part for me. Trading cards were these physical things, right? So, get the, more, so the sale, but not, and, and I know you were playing around with NFTs at the same time. Well, at that point, I didn't know what an NFT was, fortunately. Uh, I still may not know what one is, but just kidding. Um, so here we are, you know, 2020, and actually, I'm saying what can I do next? And the first thing I actually thought about was video games. I said, I should get the video game business. So I went out to the sports leagues, I went out to um, the, the players and said, hey, you know, what would you think about, should we take over the NBA 2K business? Should we take over the, the Madden business? And, you know, there was actually a lot of interest from the sports partners to say, hey, could you do something different? And then I realized that was a really complicated business. And I was like, too hard, you know, really big, strong companies. And so then we looked at trading cards. And what I found in trading cards was what you dream of of an entrepreneur. Two companies owned by, you know, guys that were, you know, and by the way, I have huge respect for the guy who, who owned Tops, Michael Eisner. He was the, you know, the, the, the CEO of Disney. Disney. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly successful CEO. Um, but they were kind of sleepy businesses. And, you know, uh, and they got hot because of um, just they, they were growing. And then COVID came and helped it accelerate. And we looked at it and thought there were so many things they weren't doing well. And so what we did is, well, they were kind of asleep. Um, we went to all the sports properties and to all the players and said, hey, We've got a better way to do this. You can make a lot more money. We're going to cut you in in action. We're going to make you a partner. And we were able to get Major League Baseball and his players, the NBA and his players, and the NFL and his players to give us really long-term deals to all the trading card rights. And before anyone figured it out... And that just drove... The, that meant the acquisition price of Tops was much lower. Well, it right? meant the acquisition price was kind of what they had left in terms. So yeah. we signed a 20-year deal with baseball, but they had four years left. So we essentially just paid Tops the four years mm -hmm. remaining of the cash flow they would have made by owning the business. So we bought it, you know, put it in perspective, we came up with the idea at the end of 2020. Uh, we bought Tops for $535 million January 1st, 2022. Today that business is probably worth 15 to $20 billion. Yeah. So it's, and, it's been and, the best thing we've ever done. All right, and, uh, and I, did, I also didn't realize that this, tra this trading card world that again feels so old to me is incredibly vibrant. You've got tens of thousands of people going around to these events that happen. You know, and I, yeah, I, I'd say I look. I was a giant collector as a kid. Did you collect cards as a kid? Well, they didn't exist in Australia. We were, <laughs> you know, we barely got beyond didgeridoos at that point. But, okay. Well, yeah. Look, I, I grew up a real collector, and then I hadn't collected cards since I was, you know, kind of 12 years old. And what I realized was, by the time I started thinking about this at the end of 2020, this was already a big business. If you yeah. put it in perspective, the two market leaders were probably making you know, close to a billion dollars in profit a year off of, of, of sports cards, not revenue, profit. Mm -hmm. And so what was interesting is the cards were, here's the way it worked, and this was what we figured out in one second. I'll tell you guys, for, for the kids in here, the founder of StockX, 
is the person that really helped me figure this idea out. Because what he said to me is, Michael, in your existing business, sports properties give you rights, and then um, you sell that merchandise to consumers. And you used to have a retail in between, so there were kind of like three or four people in that transaction. In the trading card business, a sports property of players would give the rights to a trading card company. They would sell those cards to distributors. Distributors would sell those cards to hobby shops and retailers. They'd sell them to resellers who would put them on eBay to sell them to a collector. And that's why I said, wow, we could do a lot to kind of build this business more direct to consumer. And at the same time, we saw the products weren't innovating, the marketing no. wasn't innovating. So I'd say what's been amazing for me is if you say right now what's happening in the market, art is way down. Sneakers, secondary sneakers, way down. Watches, down. Cars, down. Trading cards, the category's way up because we brought a lot of new collectors so into the So you've got the LeBron and Bronny card. It's a good card. How's that doing? That was a retail price for us half a million or something for that? I think someone off, so we don't sell cards. In the, the way it works, cards are randomized. So no different than when I was a kid in Boston. You don't know where you're going to get a pack of cards. So, you know, as an example, someone... So someone's going to... Open the chewing gum and get uh, LeBron no and chewing, Bronny. There's no chewing, no gum, chewing gum anymore. anymore. That's, do that. I will tell you a funny story. Just let, two nights ago. Hey, I was trying to pretend that I knew something about yeah. this class business. So two nights ago, uh, someone came up to me at an event that we were a uh, part of and said, hey, would you and Robert Kraft open these packs of gum? Robert whispered to me and said, I'm really hungry. I'm just dead. So this happened two nights ago. It's probably going to end up on the internet. Um, I, and so we opened these 1980 packs of, of, of cards, this pack of gum, and Robert starts chewing the gum. I'm like, Robert, that gum is 44 <laughs> years old. <laughs> and he, he's spitting the gum out, it's going all over. Say, Lots of people don't looking. Don't swallow the gum. Yeah, this 44 is very years, important. 44 yeah. year old gum is probably not very good. Um, okay, so we've got we to move on because there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I want get, to get to with you. So your latest big swing is entering the sports betting world. Yeah. Um, Behind the curve, right, there are two market leaders. I don't know, you can, you can tell us the percentage of the market that FanDuel and DraftKings have. Um, that's a pretty risky thing. You didn't need to do that. You want to talk a little bit about entering that of business? Course I need to do that. Okay. I'd be bored if not. <laughs> but it's, it's Matt, right? It, it's just, it, it's, I think, to everybody who's into sports, it's just amazing how much of mainstream coverage of sports now includes a gambling component, right? And that's been, that's the last five years, has been transformed. But, but these, these two companies have, have been there, they've built massive franchises. Yeah, so here's what I'll tell you. Um, in the first business we started in the Finax Commerce, which is our merchandise business, that's now a $6.7 billion business this year. That business, when we started in 2011, we were the number three player, far, be far behind number one. So you don't mind number three, it doesn't deter you. So, so yeah. today we're number one by a mile. Yeah. Okay. In collectibles, we didn't sell a card until January 1st, 2022. Now we're number one. Okay. There's nothing I love more than being the underdog. That is fun. So um, I decided to get in the sports gambling business in spring of 21. And when I told my board in spring of 21, they thought I was a genius. I went to my board, you know, we've raised $5 billion. You know, we've got some of the best investors in the world. We said, look, we're in the sports gambling business. And they said, oh, Michael, this is genius. You know, DraftKings is a $32 billion market cap. Flutter, who owns FanDuel, had a $40 or $50 billion market cap. Um, and so they, I said, look, but I'm not going to do it yet because the economics don't make sense. These companies are spending so much money to acquire yeah. customers. You know, one year later, Basically, people said to me, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Like, the stock's all down by 80%. You can't ever make money in this business. I said, just keep calm, keep calm. Um, and so I was actually, you know, our board, I think, well, they believed in me. They were pretty, you know, not comfortable with us getting a business that they really perceived to be bad. One year later, 2023, now FanDuel and DraftKings are doing better, but they said, hey, can you break through? So that's where we are now. FanDuel and DraftKings have 80% of the market. They have a duopoly, okay? Um, for us, that's a party I can't wait to break up. Um, I'm excited. And, you got, I'm, I'm, and you've got your 100 I'm, million I'm, I'm, users, I'm, right? I'm excited for it. Yeah. Uh, we have, look, we think we have a few advantages. Um, the Fanatics brand is well known by a lot of customers. Uh, and we've proven, so here, I'll tell you the most interesting stat. We launched one year ago. Um, DraftKings has spent $7.7 .7 billion from losses, CapEx, so the capital into the business, and on m and buying companies, 7.7 .7 billion. FanDuel, which is owned by Flutter, spent 6.4 billion. Caesars and um, ESPN, which is managed by Penn Gaming, $4 billion. MGM, 
two and a half billion dollars. We've spent about a billion so far. We think we'll make money by the time we spend about another three to four hundred million. So within a billion and a half or less spend, we think we'll make money. Here's the most interesting thing. We've been live for one year. We have 5% of the US market one year later from basically nothing. Um, we're in the fourth spot right now. So ESPN is above you? Or? Under us by a mile. Uh, okay. Yeah. ESPN's got about one and a half percent of the market. We have about 5% of the market. So for me, but this is my biggest flight I've taken on, and I love that. Like, one of the things as a you know, founder entrepreneur that I guess gets me the most excited is I don't know whether I'm going to win or lose in this business. Maybe I'm going to piss away a billion and a half dollars and the whole thing's not going to work. But I like that. That's a challenge. And so for me, here's what I say. Gambling's going to be a $70 billion North American market. There's going to be $20 billion in annual profits made in that business within a decade. So it's probably $300 billion in value. I've got 110 million customers. I've got one of the most well-known brands in sports. Um, by the way, the whole business is driven by VIP. There's 20 million legal betters. 150,000 drive almost half the market. Okay? I feel like I'm going to go get those people one by one. All those 150,000 people. We're getting to fanatics. So we'll see. Next year, maybe we'll say this guy was an idiot and he fell on his face, or maybe we'll have 10 or 15. Okay, I, well, I won't go in that direction, but I will. Uh, I will do I'm a. Just making things from time I, to time. I will do a giant pivot. So I think it's um, it's pretty evident from the last 10 or 15 minutes that Michael's a pretty hard charging business guy. But the thing that I've noticed about you is that relationships and personal relationships are more important to you than anything else. So, and, and by the way, I'm not just blowing smoke here. My sense is that that is both your personal life and your professional life are joined together and they're joined together by people with whom you have very deep personal relationships and to whom you're very loyal. You want to talk a little bit about that? And I mean, you, you've already mentioned Robert Kraft. I know, I know your relationship with him. You know, you're really close with James Harden. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about how relationships work for you and how they fit in your know, professional Michael and personal Michael? Yeah, look, if there's one thing I could leave this room with, I could tell you we all gravitate to what we're good at. Okay, we should gravitate to what we're good at. And... Um, you know, for a kid who barely met out of high school, everyone in here should know this. this is a real, this is not made up. I got a 780 combined on my SATs, okay? That's hard to do that poorly, okay? A 780, I think you legit get 400 for putting your name on the SATs, okay? So 780 combined. You didn't get your middle name right, I think. Yeah, I got that right too, okay? So 780 combined, for the part semester I went to college, I had a 1.87 GPA, okay? I thought I was thriving, by the way. <laughs> Some of that was driven by co-op, too, so it was probably not even that good. The reason I tell you this is, like, we're all different. Some people can read intense amounts of information. That's how they learn. I learn from the people around me. Okay, so what you'll see around me is probably the most diverse group of people. I'm going to learn something from you today. I'm going to learn something from people in this room today. I'm going to learn from somebody, any of the 22,000 people that work in our company. So I'm always, that's the way I learn. And so to me... Relationships have probably been the most important thing to driving the success of our business. Because when you're having good times, relationships don't really matter. But during tough times, relationships are everything. And that's how you figure out how to get through the toughest periods with great relationships. So I have built a lot of important relationships. I think those relationships have helped us to be a lot more successful and have guided us when we do. So we need a good strategy. We need to have a good business for our partners. But with the right relationships, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Okay, so how... What are the similarities and differences between having a relationship with Robert Kraft and James Harden? Just to use two examples of, at least in the public eye, completely different kinds of human beings at very different stages of their lives. Yeah. So. Or Joel Embiid. I mean, pick pick somebody that, yeah. that you want on the player side. Yeah. Well, I'll, so. I'll give you a great story with you all that I have to modify because I see a few cameras, but I'm going to give you an almost accurate story here. Um, so Joel and Robert have become pretty friendly through me, okay? And, um, you know, one of the things when I watch Robert, and I study people like crazy. I'll watch Robert and, you know, he is so nice to everybody. And he figures one day maybe that just helps. Maybe that gets a little edge in what he does. Okay, maybe it helps a player who wants to come to him and play for a little bit less money. Maybe it helps, maybe he gets a lucky call from a referee one day because you just never know what that can do. Well, now I see Joel and he watches that. I watch how Joel treats people. 
And so we're always learning from each other. And so what I love to do is just put people from different backgrounds. Look, everyone knows, you know, I'd have this small party called the White Party. I'm going to ask you about that. You are stealing my best lines, man. I'm helping. You. So, <laughs> All right, okay. So he, here's the thing that's interesting. The backgrounds of the people are so different. What I love to do is see, you know, I watch Travis Scott talk to the CEO of Verizon. You know, I watch, you know, um, you know, uh, Kevin Durant talking to somebody else, great. And you see, and then great things come from these things. You know, I watch Jay-Z having a conversation with somebody else. And so, you know, I think that's how we are learn from each other. That's how we help each other. One of the things I actually hate is when people actually aren't trying to build each other up and kind of push them. So I'm always one who I want everyone around me to do great. And I think it goes back to relationships. If you really focus on, and you have to make these relationships authentic, okay? Our relationships has been built over time. We didn't just meet and become, you know, like, We've, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years and, and uh, we've built an authentic relationship. And then when you need something from me, you say, hey, Michael, come show up for this I'm thing. I'm sorry about that. Right. By but, 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 but by the way, I don't even ask what I'm doing. I just, where do you, I'm, I'm in LA, where do you need me? I'm coming to do this for you. And that's relationships, okay? And when I did uh, Fanatics Fest a couple weeks ago. Another uh, one of my topics here. <laughs> I'm just trying to help. Oh, okay. All right, so, but, uh, so, so what would you like to ask? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to pump you up, man, and you're not giving me the, enough opportunity to do that. Today, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so before we before we get to parties and fanatics first, which which is just incredible, the other side of you that I've seen, and I've said this to you, I mean, Saj is here in the audience somewhere. The the quality of the people that you've put around you in the business is incredible. And that's not what hard charging founders are supposed to do, right? It's all about you. So how have you thought about building the senior team? And how do you how do you relate to how do you manage your senior team, which is just super impressive. And you've got people from, you know, s serious business, non sports backgrounds, right to to work with you. So first, I'd say, I don't agree with you. I think it is what, what you have to do to be successful. I think if you're a hard-charging entrepreneur and you don't get the right people around you, you will never build a business of scale. So for me, you know, think about saying we're in three businesses, right? We have the original business, which you know was a $6.7 billion company selling licensed sports merchandise. We have the collectibles business, uh, which we all, once all the rights kick, kick in, is about a $3 billion business today. Um, and then we have the sports gambling business that we just started. And they're very different businesses. So. What I would tell you is I would do anything to get the right talent to work with us. And, you know, the best example is the person who runs my gambling business, he was the, 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 the guy who basically started FanDuel in the gambling business. He was the CEO of FanDuel, who's the number one company that was 50% of the market. And so when I kept asking people who's the best person in the gambling business, they said, oh, it's the guy who runs FanDuel. And so, you know, I said, okay, who knows him? Get me to him. Call, used a relationship. Hey. I actually called someone who should not have introduced me to him because he was an important partner of them who was, that FanDuel was paying them tens of millions of dollars. I said, look, I need you to get me the right introduction to him. I'm calling him, I said, hey, you know what? Don't come to me, I'll fly to you. I flew to Chicago to see him, had multiple meetings, convinced him, leave that big company, come, come to see him with yeah. me. And by the way, he's gonna make hundreds of millions of dollars for having made that decision as the, as the CEO and founder of that business with us. Um, you know, I think we set up the right framework for people. You got to make sure you're, you're very aligned with people. But I like, I want to have the best team on the planet, and I want to do whatever it takes to get that team. And then the most important thing, we got to get people to work together. Because one of the problems is that you can have a great team. I mean, think about how many teams in sports. You say, oh, you know, we're going to win the championship this year because we got all these great players. And then before you know it, I didn't get the ball enough. You know, this didn't work. You know, they're fighting, the team implodes. So you see that in sports all the time. So getting people to work together is also really important. And sometimes you gotta be really tough with that. Like, like I had two of my top guys, you know, um, not my executives, one level down, who were really important in business, and they were just fighting like crazy. I brought them into my office um, within the last year. I said, hey, both these guys, they literally like couldn't work together. I said, you guys are each really important to me. I love you guys. You're doing a great job. But if you guys can't work together, you're both fired. Like, get out of here. But they work together pretty well after that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? So, you know, you, like, sometimes you gotta call people out. Like, you, you, you gotta make people work together as well. So, you know, and by the way, that's a daily grind too. You, you gotta figure out what makes each, each person tick. But, you know, we do a lot to get great people. Right before I, you know, jumped up here with you, someone hit me about someone we're gonna hire. I'm gonna get in the car, call that person, help recruit them. So I spend a lot of time interviewing people, recruiting people, because without that, you got nothing. 
Okay, let's do parties for a couple of minutes and then I'd love to give people in the audience a chance to ask you some questions. Um, so, White Party is kind of famous. Uh, no doubt costs a lot of money to put that on. Um, what does it take to build an incredible event like that and why does it make sense from you from a business standpoint to do that? Yeah, so we do three events a year that are kind of our big marquee events. And now I've got to interrupt you. Interrupt you. <laughs> well, so, you know, I went, you know, I went to your Super Bowl lunch yeah. in Las Vegas and uh, First of all, I, it reminded me how tall quarterbacks are. The Manning brothers and Tom Brady were talking Very to each other. Very small relative to like Joel Embiid, who you spoke I, Exactly right. They're only 6'6", six, six, so 6'5", six, or 6'6". Six, six. But, you know, I was, uh, I, at lunch, I sat down and I was talking to Stan Kroenke about his wineries in Santa Barbara, which was not something I expected to be happening in, on, my, on a Friday in Las Vegas. Um, and I also talked to Gavin Newsom about what was happening in politics and the, the quality of the people that, that you got in the room for that day, with the single exception of me, was incredibly high. Um, well, you need a charity event every once in a while. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, Set yourself up for that. I'm always a, I like to be made fun of and give people yeah, like, a lot of a hard time. I you. You know, that's tax deductible. <laughs> um, so, look, I really believe um, you want to get people to want to help you and build together. So we do three events a year. The Super Bowl that you were kind enough to come to with us. And you know, we do, there we do this lunch that Jeffrey spoke about where we get the 100 most important people around the Super Bowl to come together. It's an incredible lunch. We do a party that's pretty well known. And, and then we have a, a suite filled with incredible people. We do the white party. Uh, and then we do Fanatics Fest, which we just launched for the first time this year. And for me, uh, what we like to do is, you know, again, get people from different backgrounds together. The one that's actually the most fun for me isn't the white party, it's Fanatics Fest. Because for Fanatics Fest, what I had to do was give a give back yeah, to but sports that, fans. Yeah, but that one makes sense because that was for your customer base. Yeah, that's right. right? These, these super elite events, which no doubt cost a lot of money, uh, again, uh, what's, the, what's the art and the science sure. of putting together groups? Uh, uh, and why does it work uh, from a business standpoint yeah, uh, uh, for you? Absolutely. So if you think about the white park party, and by the way, we're an $8 billion company the white party party cost a few million dollars. So in the grand scheme of things, it's actually, you know, relative to you know our company, what we spend on events, it's actually not a lot of money. But uh, really what we want to accomplish with that is bringing all these incredible people together who then we build deeper relationships with. And so that's a party that people, you know, look, there's less than 400 people come to it. Everyone in the world wants to come to it. And so, you know, the people that are there, you build special bonds and relationships with. And not only have I, have I had a lot of people that have so been are you, there. So are you consciously working the room in those environments? Well, or party, is it more the passive party, than the that? The party starts at 5 p.m. It goes to like 6 a.m. I'd say from 5 p.m. to maybe 10 p.m. I'm working the room. From 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. I'm probably less coherent, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I know, you know, uh, of course I would expect you don't sleep. But you do sleep and you look after yourself uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what you've told me. I'm, okay, I'm not going to believe it. Three act, well, okay, so let's talk, let's talk uh, fanatics. Hold, hold, hold on, just to, to, to make a oh, point. Got the... So, I mean, uh, of course it's slow today. I was going to actually give you my Whoop score from yesterday. It was bad. I, I realized Whoop is a terrible device. It's now making me up, upgrade itself. Um, I had three hours and 40 minutes of sleep last night. Okay. Um, uh, take that in. Um, so, okay, so so I, I saw you, you had this thing, imagine this, it's New York in the middle of the summer in Midtown in August, right? When yeah. everyone's left New York, uh, there's no one there, it's hot and sticky and pretty miserable. And, you know, the, the Times Square area isn't what it used to be and the Javits Center is over there, at whatever it is, 8th Avenue and 40th or wherever the Javits Center is. And you decide you're going to throw this massive party for all of your fans. And you didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. And then I saw you, I, mean, I don't know, it ended on the weekend and I saw you maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday. And you told me that you had 5 billion social media hits in the first... 36 hours or something. So uh, let us get inside a little bit. What was 70,000 people in person, 5,000, so 5 billion social media hits. What was your thinking there? How did it work? What did you learn from it? Yeah, well, my thinking was um, in the trading card business, there's a big show called The National. And it gets, and it, it, when you go there, you get two quick reactions. One is more than 100,000 people, incredible, the collector's enthusiasm. The second thing was, um, if you're a collector, it's like, you think you're like in the 80s still. It looks like it's yeah. 40 years old. And then I went to Comic-Con. Comic-Con, I was thinking. Yeah, I went to yeah. Comic-Con. Yeah. 
in New York two years ago. I'm like, this is awesome. I want that. So it teaches you that plagiarism is the best form of flattery. <laughs> in the, yes. in the, not in school, by the way, but anything other than school and business. Don't be shy about that. So I looked at Comic-Con. I said, I'm copying this for sports. And I literally said to Saj, find me the guy who runs Comic-Con. Got the guy in the office. Hey, by the way, you now work for us. Let's go. And uh, he came to join, and now he runs Fanatics Fest. But what was our real goal? Our goal was to put on the greatest sports festival in the world. No one had ever thought about anything like this. It's almost weird. Like, right, but from a standing start, right? You hadn't done this before. It, correct. And by the way, this is the craziest thing. I got back from taking my daughter who goes here on vacation, um, you know, before she's going to come to school. And I got back on August 10th. They started August 17th. We'd sold like 8,000 tickets by the time I got back. I'm like, this is going to be an absolute debacle. Okay. I thought of seven days before it went off, like I should cancel this. Like I should cancel this. And then I go into like the fighting mode that I have. I am going to do everything I need to count. What can I do to make this great? I'm going to do, and I, but I'm going to do every bit of press. I thought I was like an overnight radio host for, for a minute. I was like a used car salesman, hyping Fanatics Fest. Okay, but I got out there and did interviews everywhere. Yeah. Okay, then I called all my friends. You talk about building relationships, you know, you know. Hey, I need you to come through. I, and, I was and, listening to you putting the hard word on some unnamed athletes to and, and, and show the, up. And here was the crazy thing. Everyone showed up. Yep. Everyone came through. And so, and then I got really lucky. Actually, Jay-Z said to me like three weeks before, he's like, and, so I don't know how many people know, Jay-Z is um, one of the co-founders of our gambling business. And so Jay's favorite brand is actually the 4040 Club that he, he owned for years. There's a lot of his music for anyone who listen, has listened to his music. He said, hey, I want to build a pop-up with the 4040 at the Fanatics Fest. Let's invite all the celebrities and athletes and artists to just come hang there. So instead of them coming in and leaving, they'll come and hang. I remember looking up and I watch, I, look, I see like Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, Lil Baby, Quavo, Kevin Durant. I'm like, this is the middle of a sports festival. These guys will have, and by the way, Travis Scott was DJing. Sorry, I forgot that. Okay. I'm like, this is insane. And so this is where relationships come in, right? Because I couldn't have launched this without everyone in my network kind of saying, hey, we're going to help you pull this off. Now, by the way, two weeks later, Drewski was a friend of mine. He was one of the, you know, I'd say he's the youngest, hot, hottest comedian. He came to me and said, hey, I'm watching this festival in Atlanta. I need you to come. And I had no interest in going. But I went for him because he's my guy. And he came and supported me. And I felt bad that he got beaten in every race by every person who took him on at the next festival. So, of course, I had to support him. <laughs> okay, so, very unathletic. So, um, whoever's <laughs> controlling the... Val, can, can we get a few extra minutes because I've got to follow up on this topic. Can we get like five extra minutes? Um, so Michael, the... You get the, as, much, as, much, as much overtime as you want. But we are on the clock. Um, <laughs> so that convergence of entertainment, sports, popular culture is something that you've, you, either, either you developed it or certainly took advantage of it uh, more than anybody else. So. Was that a conscious decision? Did that just happen serendipitously? It really didn't. I'd say, um, if I've learned one thing about karma and doing the right thing, when you do the right thing, things come around. You know, for me, um, we were never trying to be a culturally relevant company. We weren't trying to be around people of culture. You know, and, and all of my relationships, they, they are very authentic. And you know that with me. It's like, you know, it's like, I do what feels right. I won't do something that doesn't feel right. No matter what, you know, someone comes to me with a business proposal, I'm like, how much money we can make from it? If it's, if it's not authentic, it doesn't feel right. We're not touching it. So, um, you know, it's, I, I'll tell you, it's been really interesting because what I always try to do in all these relationships that help us build our business is give back more to each person. How can we help them with what they're building? Uh, and how can we invest in the things they're doing and support the things that they're doing? But look, I definitely recognize we do sit in the middle of culture today. Um, and, you know, look, you saw that at USC when Travis Scott and Mitchell Ness, one of the companies that we own, launched the Cactus Jack USC collaboration when we came here last April. And, you know, you had four or 5,000 students around the, the bookstore and everyone just took, you know, get sight so, of Travis. So I've, I've, I've got to embarrass you uh, with a story that I don't you think is... Me. Oh, kind of not and again, I, I, I don't know whether this one should be recorded, but... Um, <laughs> You'll remember that we, you know, when uh, USC pivoted commencement from Alumni Park to the Coliseum, uh, President Fault wanted to do something nice for graduates. And she had this idea that um, Fanatics Cactus Jack branded hats might not be a bad idea, given the fact that it was the summer. 
in LA. That happened about 10 days before graduation. So I was tasked with convincing Michael, one, that this was a good idea, two, that it could be done in those number of days. And you immediately said, I'll get on and I'll do it. And then you gave us the hats. Um, and that was, a, that was the, the relationship circle, right? And, and we were honored to do it. You know what, when I called Travis and said, hey, would you mind if we put your brand, which is one of the hottest brands to, to young people in the world, uh, he's like, I love USC, I would love to do it. It'd be my pleasure. When you called us, we, we were happy to do it. So again, that just goes to relationships. And if there's one thing, I'll, I'll say another thing to everyone in, in here. When you do the right thing and don't worry about how it comes back to you, it generally comes back to you plus more. And so we've always taken that philosophy. So I don't know how we can end an event like this, um, particularly since we took a bit of a risk in thinking about merch for the merch king and collectibles for the collectibles king. But when I was in India last week, we asked Lincoln Riley to give you a helmet since wow, we know that. you've got a uh, jersey. So, Michael, thanks for being here. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. I think there's going to be a reception outside. Please join me in thanking Michael again. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing.